Signalis is one of this year's best games. Whether it'll catch the attention of the Game Awards, which will be announcing its nominees a couple of hours after this video comes out, remains to be seen. But if you're a fan of indie games or survival horror games, then it definitely deserves your attention. Developed by two-person game studio Rose Engine, Signalis will give classic survival horror fans exactly what they want in terms of the gameplay. There's a lot to talk about in terms of game design and the systems that players will have to grapple with, which I'll get to shortly. But this is also the foundation for one of the most unique, engaging and memorable stories that I've seen in a horror game. The game is set behind the Iron Curtain of a solar system-wide Cold War, with a totalitarian force known as the Nation ruling most of the planets thanks to a vast population of cyborgs, or replicas, who live alongside and serve the humans who here are called Gestalts. The late Cold War aesthetic of the Nation is underlined by a retrofuturism which sees the Nation powered by the pinnacle of late 1980s technology, all of which is presented in a top-down pixel art style reminiscent of the PlayStation 1 era, with anime character designs and cutscenes, and a discordant industrial soundtrack which works well to keep you on edge at all times. We take control of a replica called Elster as she awakens after her ship crashes on an icy world. Her search for her companion, a gestalt called Ariane, takes her from the ice to a mining facility and into the depths below. She finds that other replicas are acting out, attacking on sight, and the gestalts are nowhere to be seen. The environmental storytelling in the levels is superb, drawing your eyes to details that flesh out everything we don't get to see, from the slaughter that led to the current events to the more ordinary violence of the regime beforehand all of which is built upon by the various notes and artefacts that you find at various points in your exploration. But just as the profiteering of Whale and Yutani isn't the point of Alien, so the harsh dictatorship of the nation is but a backdrop to the deeper cosmic horror that underpins the story. The developers took inspiration from Robert W. Chambers' The King in Yellow, which appears as an artefact in game, as well as H.P. Lovecraft. The order of events, what is and isn't real, and the meaning of what occurs is all open to interpretation by the player, and one of the reasons why it's best for you to experience it for yourself. The only thing I will say, which is sort of a spoiler, but a necessary one, is that when you get to the end credits for the first time, you should immediately afterwards choose to start a new game. This ending isn't actually the end of the game, and the story continues, but you lose that if you shut the game down after the credits have rolled. All of these elements, though, come together with the survival horror gameplay to create an experience that will not only keep you guessing, but also keep you on your toes. There are no scripted jump scares in Signalis, but you will jump plenty, the atmosphere built by the storytelling and art direction feeding into a gameplay loop that puts you continually on edge, every room presenting tactical decisions that could be the difference between life and death a couple of hours further into the game as much as right in that moment. As in the classic Resident Evil games, Signalis is built around labyrinthine areas which you progress through in a non-linear fashion, exploration and frequent backtracking necessary to open up all of the rooms and, in turn, locate the keys or puzzle pieces that will allow you to exit that area altogether. The challenge in doing this comes from the enemies that populate each area, the limited ammunition you have which prevents you from killing them all, and the limited inventory space to carry things, which forces you to make decisions on what you pick up and how often you retrace your steps through an area which may be filled with enemies. The game limits you to 6 inventory slots, with no prospect of upgrading this at any point. As you need space to carry things you find, this effectively restricts you to one weapon at a time. You can carry single-use side weapons, which, as in the Resident Evil remake, allow you to repel an enemy at short range. You can also kill enemies by kicking them when they're on the ground, which doesn't enable you to be more gung-ho. You do still have to knock them down with bullets or a side weapon, both of which are in limited supply, but it does serve as a way to incentivize smart play and careful resource management. Healing items include repair sprays and patches, which individually heal a small amount but heal more when combined, and auto-injectors which fully heal you. You're provided with a fair amount of these, but it's very easy to take damage if you even collide with an enemy, or an environmental hazard such as fire or barbed wire, meaning the carelessness will cost you heals that you may need later. Although there are different classes of enemies, most can be defeated by downing them with bullets. However, they can reanimate later on in the game if their body is just left. You can use flares to burn them, much like burning the Crimson Heads in the Resident Evil remake, but this is also a limited resource. The other option is to reduce the chance of them returning by walking rather than running through the area where you killed them. Running around everywhere is a sure way to get you noticed, even by the dead. The other side of this is that there is a limited amount of stealth you can utilise. In some circumstances, it's possible to use the shadows and staying quiet to sneak past enemies. It's not a perfect system, but it is useful for avoiding resource-intensive combat, though enemies will not only notice you if you run, but also if you have your radio on, or in some cases when you're using your torch. The only enemy in the game that I found to be more irritating than an interesting challenge was the one who you have to defeat by finding the correct radio frequency to identify her among her duplicates. The amount of static and flashing lights on screen during this is dizzying, and when there are other enemies present as well, it feels as though you're trying to make your way through with your eyes and ears plugged by useless stimuli. We'll come back to this point when talking about accessibility.
Boss fights in the game are infrequent but fun. The game does give you some additional ammo and warns you that they're coming, but they are still a test of your resource management up to this point. They also serve as a puzzle, since there will be a trick to downing the boss and you can't simply blast away at them and hope for the best. Speaking of puzzles, these are overall fairly straightforward. Some are simply a case of ferrying items to their correct place, while most of the more complex ones involve the use of the radio and working out or using frequencies to get the answer. They are taxing, but on the whole are well thought through and they shouldn't stump you for hours on end. If you're an experienced survival horror gamer, then I recommend diving in on survival difficulty. It will test you, particularly in enemy heavy areas, but it's undoubtedly the most fun mode to play in. If you're less used to this type of game, then lower difficulties should help you build up to that, but the game does an excellent job of pushing you into and incentivizing proper use of its systems, and multiple playthroughs are definitely worth it. The only real negatives of the game are on the accessibility front. Signalis is an indie game created by two people, so there were always going to be limitations to what they could do. They have still tried to provide options such as reducing camera shake, the choice to toggle or hold buttons for sprinting and aiming, and different controller layouts, though not full button remapping, as well as a combat difficulty slider and options to automatically reload or equip side weapons. The developers do provide photosensitivity warnings, as well as content warnings, which is good. Unfortunately, as mentioned, the static effects and noise overload in certain areas can feel like an attack on your senses, and there's no way to turn this down or off, which along with the sheer volume of flashing lights and images throughout, will make this game simply impossible to play for some. Given the quality of the game, that's a real shame. Despite the accessibility shortcomings, Signalis is a superb game. It has a unique visual style, a compelling cosmic horror story, and fun, challenging gameplay systems that are the essence of good survival horror. I really cannot recommend this game enough. I want to know what you think. If you've played Signalis, what was your verdict? If you haven't, will you be picking it up? Leave a comment and let me know. If you enjoyed this video, then give it a like and consider subscribing to keep up to date with all my content, like the video that just popped up, which YouTube thinks you should watch next. Check out the links in the description to join my Patreon for as little as £1 per month, or donate to my GoFundMe and get your name in the credits of my videos, like those rolling up now, who are one thank for supporting me and my content. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.